brothers and sisters, I, I have to begin by, by making you sure you understand that what the fact that I am giving this presentation says about me makes me very comfortable. But I am not sure that what it says about you for attending this lecture will make you feel particularly comfortable. And the reason is, is because of the words of an individual who spent much of his life studying the book of Revelation. He said, and I quote, the book either finds a man mad or leaves him that way. <laughs> Am I among equals here? Uh, we're gonna have a good time then if you, like me, have gone through the labyrinth of Revelation and, and found it tough sledding. It, it really is. Right from the beginning, the first five words, the revelation of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Is it the revelation about Jesus or is it the revelation that belongs to Jesus? Which is it? Is it one, is it a revelation that focuses on possession or is it a revelation that focuses on disclosure? As we read the context of Revelation itself, we, would, we could say one of the things it does is, is it, or it, uh, it shows possession. That is to say, Elohim truly did give to his son, Jehovah, the power of being omniscient. That is, to all know, that is all knowingness. The power of prognostication resides in Elohim, but he gave his spirit, we understand, to his son without measure. And when he did so, it allowed the son to possess that marvelous ability of being able to know the present, the past, and the future. Joseph Smith put it this way. The great Jehovah contemplated the whole of the events connected with the earth pertaining to the salvation of man before it came rolling into existence or ever the morning stars sang together for joy. The past, the present, and the future were and are with him one eternal now. Ooh, the past the present and the future are with the great Jehovah sharing in the divine nature of the great Elohim one eternal now meaning that he dwells in the past the present and the future he knows these things and certainly the book of Revelation is a testimony to the depth and power and breadth of the Lord's knowledge and more particularly of his foreknowledge however it is not this aspect of, uh, of the revelation of Christ we're going to focus on for the few minutes that we have today. But rather, it is that portion of the revelation which discloses Jesus. In other words, what I want to do in the time that we have today is take a look at the testimony which John brings to each one of us through the power of the imagery of revelation. What does he tell us about the Lord that we don't find in other pieces of Christian literature, particularly the scriptures? I would like to begin with a statement that the Lord makes about himself that I believe forms the very framework of what the Lord, right at the beginning of the Revelation, wants the reader to know about him. Would you read with me, those of you who have your scriptures, from Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. The Lord says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I'm intrigued that he describes himself by using the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, I am Omega. But in this, he is symbolizing the fact that he is the beginning, we could say the author of our salvation. All who are born into the world are born with the light of Christ. That light lifts them and sustains them, becomes a law, becomes uh, their conscience, will move them along if they do not resist it. Further, Jesus Christ is the omega of the salvation process. Those who resist not the light and allow the light to abound in them will find that that light will grow brighter and brighter until the perfect day. When that day comes, we will find, as Moroni so testified, that we have become perfect through the grace of Christ. And further, we have become one with him and with the Father in all things. He truly makes us one, and that is part of the salvation process indeed. The Lord says that he is the one who is and who was and who is to come. This 
very awkward statement, uh, it's awkward in the Greek, comes out a little better in, in the English, is actually a rephrase of the Tetragrammaton. When, when Moses goes up to the mountain and says, who shall I tell Israel you are? God says, you will tell them, I am that I am, the great I am who sent you. The essence of the idea is being. God is, but, but that doesn't say it. God was and God will be forevermore. The central message in this title is the eternal nature of the God that each one of us worship. The Savior is at the center. I, I'm intrigued that in John's statement, he uses the preposition apo that should take the genitive. But instead of putting the rest of the phrase in genitive, John keeps it in the nominative. Thus, I believe that his unusual construction is teaching us that the Savior is always subject, that it is he who holds the initiative in all things. The title does something else. It also brings the great Jehovah onto the stage of history. He doesn't stand outside history, but rather he comes within history and therefore he executes his will so far as the salvation of humankind is concerned within the context of history itself, a history which he himself, by the way, shapes. The last title that the Lord uses to describe himself is that of the Almighty. The Greek word pantokrator does not mean one who is omnipotent but rather it designates one who orchestrates and brings about, one who shapes and creates. What Jesus is saying here is, I am the one who shapes and I am the one who creates. I will make of earth's history a beautiful mosaic that in the end, though there are some very rough places, will be indeed an object of art to the greatness of Elohim himself. So the title then again shows that Christ operates within the context of history itself. Having declared who and what he is, the Lord now reveals himself to John the Revelator. We begin with verse 12, still in Revelation chapter 1. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, says John. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of God, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. As Jesus now discloses himself, what we meet is one surrounded by glory and light, seven uh, suggesting the idea of wholeness and completeness and perfection. He stands in the midst of seven candlesticks, the candlesticks representing his church. He is in the midst of his church. There's also a little temple imagery in this one in that the words John uses to describe the Lord's clothing is a, is a quote from the Septuagint's description of the clothing of the high priest, the long robe. The difference here is that the robe it has a girdle on it. It is clasped about the paps with a golden girdle. What does that golden girdle suggest? It suggests kingly rule. Therefore, the first disclosure of Christ is one of priests among his people, but also that of king, the one who sets the law and moves things forward in power and majesty. John says his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were the flame of fire. For you and I, whiteness suggests the Lord's purity. For John, purity would take a second seat. For him, whiteness suggests that of victory. It is the triumphant general who rides in the streets of Rome clothed in white, his wife in white, pulled by a chariot pulled by white horses, the chariot itself even being white. Therefore, we see here not so much a declaration of Christ's purity as we do a declaration of his victory. He truly is the victor. We'll see this again later on in Revelation. His eyes manifest his glory, the glory of God being intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. So here John is met by this glorious omniscient being. Verse 16, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun, as his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. 
I, I, I'm impressed that the stars, that is the leaders of the church, are in the hand of Christ. It means that he both protects and controls them. He is always there, always ministering. Of all the imagery in the book, though, this with an, a sword issuing from the Lord's mouth is really, for many, disturbing. And, and let me tell you, this isn't just a little sword. The Greek word here is rontphia. This is a Thracian broadsword, or, or it is the long tip on a spear that's sharp on both edges, a, a spear that is deliberately designed for puncturing armor. But what is it that God says of his word? It is sharp and powerful as a two-edged sword to divide and to cut and sunder. Nothing can resist the word of God. Ultimately, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Christ because of the power, the invincible power of his word. Finally, verse 16, and he had in his right, oops, excuse me, I'm sorry. Verse 17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not, for I am the first and the last. There is nothing to fear in Christ. From the beginning to the end, he is our God and our Savior, and he will indeed save each one of us if we will. Okay, the Lord's vision teaches us that he is God and King of the earth. But it does more. It shows that he is immediate, that he is intimate, and that he is cognizant. He says to the churches, I know your doings. Again, John insists that we worship a God not who is beyond time, nor one who is above time, but rather one who executes his will within the framework of time itself. Further, John testifies that Jesus is at the heart and the core of history. He is one with us in our world. Second vision. Uh, this one takes place in Revelation chapter 5. By way of background, John is caught up in vision, and he is permitted to see the throne room of the great Elohim. There God stands surrounded by his seraphs, and power emanates from him, the power that symbolizes life and judgment. John looks and says, chapter 5, verse 1, I saw in the right hand of him that sat upon the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. The, uh, it's actually a scroll, sealed, and it represents a last will or testament. In other words, it holds within its secrets the will of God that is to be manifest in every age throughout the entire secular or temporal history of the earth. God has something that needs to be done. The problem is somebody else is going to have to execute that will and the mighty angel says, who can do this thing? There's a little problem. No man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. That's interesting. Clearly, from John's vantage point, he can see the scroll. What does he mean, then, that no one can look thereon? The nuance in the Greek is not simply beholding the scroll, but actually being able to read and comprehend in such a way as to be able to execute. The mind, the will, the power of the great Elohim is simply too great. No one in heaven, not even the strong angel, you'll notice John uses that adjective, he is a strong angel. Even he can't execute it, as strong and glorious as he is. And as a result, John weeps much. There really is in danger, a danger that God's will is not going to be executed in history unless one can be found. One of the, angel, or one of the elders comes over and comforts John and says, quote, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne. And what do we expect to see? A lion, or the root of David, a, a prince standing tall and mighty. But what do we find? Neither. John sees a lamb, and it's not just a lamb. It is a lamb that is bearing an awful root wound, for it has been slain. Sfrazo means to wear a sacrificial wound, to, to bear a sacrificial wound. The lamb has been sacrificed. 
Interestingly enough, though, though the wound is absolutely staggering in its magnitude, it has not killed the lamb. In fact, the lamb bears seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth in all the earth. Seven, as I said already, is the, is the number for perfection and wholeness and fullness. Horns are the symbol of power. Eyes, the symbol of intelligence. Therefore, he sees this wounded lamb, but it is full of omnipotence and omniscience as it stands there. And why? Very likely because of the very wound that was meant to destroy, but instead, instead brought fullness and power. John is indeed taken with the greatness and the glory of the Lamb. This Lamb is truly something immediate and something very, very powerful. Verse 9, speaking of uh, the elders now. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou, thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to our God by, the blood, uh, by thy blood. Of every, or out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and nation. And, in addition, thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. The first thing to proclaim is Christ's worthiness. But class, class, am I a teacher or what? Brothers and sisters, what, what that word means is not righteousness, but rather to be fitly framed, or perfectly suited for the task. Because the lamb was wounded, he was enabled to be able to do the task. It made him fit, and the elders recognized that. This one is indeed the one with the strength who can execute the will of God. And not only has the lamb done that, but more. He has made us kings and priests unto our God. First time the Lord reveals himself, it is as king and priest. Here in chapter five we see what it means to be an heir of God and a joint heir in Christ. There are no second-class citizens in the celestial kingdom. But Christ has made each one a son, a daughter of God, full of God's power and might and majesty, even as the son is full of God's power, might, and majesty. Therefore, I'm not surprised that the elders would rejoice and the, and the uh, elders would celebrate the victory of their king. What is the message in the second vision? The lamb died. He shed his precious blood. But in doing so, he became fit and suitable to execute the will of God so far as the salvation of humankind is concerned. Second, this lesson is more subtle. The horns and the eyes certainly show us that the lamb has the attributes of deity. But it is a lamb, and it is a lamb that has been slain. Though it is full of power, nonetheless that power came through sacrifice. Therefore, you and I are forced into a new definition of omnipotence. When I was younger, I was foolish enough to believe that God was omnipotent because he possessed the power of unlimited coercion. Who can resist the power of God? But as I read Le Revelation, I find a brand new definition. And that definition is that true power as revealed in the Son comes from infinite persuasion and the invincible power of self-sacrificing love. Why is it that God is obeyed across the length and the breadth of the cosmos when he does nothing more than just simply whisper? It is because he has bounded the cosmos in his love. Yes, brothers and sisters, God is powerful because of his sacrifice of love. And because of that sacrifice, all creation will indeed do his will. The question is, if creation will, Will you and I? Let's go on now to the third vision. This is found in the 14th chapter of Revelation. John says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood upon the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. The... the uh, the position of this particular re revelation is instructive. It is placed in the book just before the full 
unmitigated wrath of God is unleashed upon a cruel, mean, and unrepentant world. It is interesting that just before blood spills across the length and breadth of the nations, John sees Christ with the 144,000. Who are these 144,000? He tells us that these are the redeemed of the earth, men and women, who have come under covenant, who keep their covenant, who are part of his patriarchal order and therefore part of his kingdom. And he has brought them because of the strength of their covenant keeping into his citadel, even Zion. Therefore, the saints are carefully and securely tucked away. And in that setting, they can find then the security that is theirs. Verse 2, and I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of, a, of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn the song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Why can they not learn it? Because only the righteous can sing this kind of song. Only the righteous can feel the protective power of God and therefore bask in it and glory in it. It is interesting that Joseph Smith has preserved the text of just such a song. And because I believe it really shows us in its praise the magnificence of the Lord, I would like to digress to read that. Those of you who would like, if you turn with me over to DNC section 84, I'm going to begin reading with verse 69. DNC 8469. For I, the Almighty, have laid my hands upon the nations to scourge them for their wickedness. And the plague shall go forth, and they shall not be taken from the earth until I have completed my work, which shall be cut short in righteousness. Until all shall know me who remain, even from the least unto the greatest, and shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, and shall see eye to eye, and shall lift up their voice, and with a voice together shall sing this new song. You ready? Boy, this, this is near rapture. The Lord hath brought against Zion. The Lord hath redeemed his people Israel. According to the election of grace, which was brought to pass by faith in the covenant of their fathers. The Lord hath redeemed his people and Satan is bound and time is no longer. The Lord hath gathered all things in one. The Lord hath brought down Zion from above. The Lord hath brought up Zion from beneath. The earth hath travailed and brought forth her strength. And truth is established in her bowels. The heavens have smiled upon her, and she is clothed with the glory of her God. For he stands in the midst of his people. Glory and honor and power and might be ascribed to our God. For he is full of mercy, justice, grace, and truth, and peace forever and ever. What a song. Can you imagine being there in that great city of Zion, when that kind of song is set to music and resounds throughout the entire halls from the voice and the heart of a people secure in their God. What a time that will be. Uh, powerful statement being made by the redeemed. Many, I find, are troubled as they now move into the book of Revelation because it really does get pretty nasty and pretty scary. The book shows us the slaughter, not simply of thousands or of tens of thousands. It suggests that there will be a slaughter of millions. How could God do that? How could God allow it? I've had my own students ask me. In order to say it just right, I'm going to read something to you. What we must remember is that the Savior does just what his name says. He saves. The paradox is the Lord's destruc destruction becomes his tool of salvation. He uses the tool, however, only when all others have failed. Still, it is the tool of salvation, and for that reason the angels can say, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy ways, thy judgments are just. The Lord is perfectly prepared to allow his destroying angels and the beasts of Satan, a certain destructive power 
even over millions of his children. Some may have trouble with this idea, but Revelation forces upon, upon us a very realistic understanding about death. From the Lord's perspective, all must die. The question is not when or how. Ultimate destiny is not determined by the moment nor by the manner of one's death. It is by the manner of one's life. Keep in mind that those who are destroyed are not annihilated. They, are, they have further existence. But for the present, they refuse to play the game by God's rules. They have become mean and violent, and so they are thrown into the penalty box, so to speak, for a price, but yet the game goes on. We must fight against the current idea that mortality is so infallibly precious that, as one scholar put it, the, the death which robs us of it must be the ultimate tragedy. Such an idea, he says, is precisely the kind of idolatry against which John was fighting. Notice that John calls the enemies the inhabitants of the earth because they have made themselves utterly at home in this transient world order. Of all, John's point is that all must die. And if at the end heaven and earth must vanish, along with those whose lives are irremediably bounded by worldly horizons, then it is surely in the accord of God's great mercy that he should send us from time to time forceful reminders of the insecurity of our tenure here on the earth. And he does that. He's always reminding us, don't anchor to mortality. Don't anchor just to this world. There is more out there, and what is out there is eternal life and eternal lives. Last uh, vision in uh, Revelation 19. Just touch upon this uh, very, very briefly. I, I apologize, I said ni 19. I really want to uh, do 14. In chapter 14, the, uh, concluding in chapter 14, we find the uh, Lord describing the great harvests. The first harvest <clears throat> is that of the world. And an angel comes from the altar, verse 14, and, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, John looks, it's not an angel, John looks, and he beholds, a white cloud, and upon the white cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And an angel came forth from the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat, up, uh, sat upon the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Notice, the Savior harvests the wheat. And he brings them into his barns, and therefore the wheat is secure while the rest of the harvesting goes on. Continuing, and he that sat upon the, uh, excuse me, verse 17, and another angel came out of the temple, and uh, having a sharp sickle, and another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. The grapes are harvested second. The wheat is harvested first. Christ harvests the wheat. Others harvest the grapes. What does this tell us? Christ comes not to destroy, but to destroy the destroyers of the earth. His destruction is actually a means of salvation. And therefore, as he comes forth in power, in might, and in great glory, it is indeed to save those who are his. And brothers and sisters, though revelation can be frightening for the wicked, revelation shows us once and for all a God that operates within history and has set the way for the salvation of all his saints. He is indeed the Almighty, and I say that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.